this is the DR Show, and today we are going to interview Gian Marco Saranzi. Let's go inside. Shh, we don't know what he's doing, so we're going to find out. Surprise! Who the fuck are you? We're from Pop Dust. Oh, <laughs> oh my God, you scared me for a second. <laughs> nice to meet you, Gianmarco. Hey, you too. Hello. How are you? We're really good today. What do you do? What are you up to? I, uh, I mean this, and then I, yeah, that's all. I had nothing else on the the books today. I've just been sitting here waiting for this wow. door completely unlocked for about ten hours now. Oh my God, you're waiting ten hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, I'm really excited to talk to you. Um, it is one of the most ballsy things to do as a, like any person to decide to be a comedian. Yes. And that I being that, that. being a soldier, being a frontline worker, these yes. are equally brave professions. Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, I failed as an actor, and so I became a comedian. No, it never goes the other way around. No one fails as a comedian and then yeah. wins an Oscar for being an actor. Wow. So that's how I got into this. So tell me from the start, you were, word on the street is you were a theater kid. Yes. And by word on the street, definitely not with any industry because nobody cared that I was a theater kid. I went to college. <laughs> I went to college for musical theater. Uh, uh, very easy degree to get. My classes were movement and voice and other things I had studied as a baby. Um, uh, I, had one I had one academic class, it was called Accounting for Actors, which was like regular accounting, but with a focus on negative numbers. Um, and uh, then I moved to New York. I paid thousands of dollars to meet casting directors and didn't get cast in anything for years. And then I said, okay, I'm gonna do stand-up comedy. Wow. What is your favorite play or musical? Uh, favorite musical is Falsettos by, by, Bill, by Bill Finn. I like this. This feels like a music video. This is, this, is, <laughs> this is ultimately what I did want to do, but now I'm doing it in a different form. Falsettos, Nine, Sunday in the Park with George. A little cliche, but Falsettos, that's cool. Uh, favorite play, Amadeus. Uh, I like a good... I like a good fucked up family drama, a little uh, August Osage County, a little Edward Albee, if you're really looking to ruin your night. Wow. Yeah. So tell me about this move to New York, because, I mean, one of the things that actually your publicist wanted to talk about was New York specifically and the crowd in New York. So tell us about the difference between a crowd in New York and in anywhere else. Well, thank you for letting them know that I have a publicist now. Yes. Uh, uh, I think New York... Is good because uh, I think if people first there's a diversity of people visiting from other places. So I, I in a way, if you can, so cliche, if you can do stand up comedy in New York, you can do stand up comedy anywhere really? because you know we do have people visiting from Oklahoma mm -hmm. and we do from Hawaii and from overseas, and uh, uh, so you have a mix of like people from visiting, and then you have a mix of New Yorkers. So I get a lot of my, my fellow Jewish people. I can make some inside baseball Jewish jokes. People who live here, some of them are cynical, but they, they, they've they dealt with shit. They're not going to go, oh, because they just saw 10 human tragedies on the subway ride yeah, yeah. To, to the club. So, so yes, I, I do love performing in New York City. What is it? What's the hardest city to perform in? Um, I'm, I've, I've been touring for coming up on two years now so i'm still figuring it out but generally i i would say it's it's gonna be in some conservative cities can be fun there there's there's a version of conservatives that like you can poke fun and you can you can razz and ultimately you know they they'd probably uh, you know shoot me if no one was looking but they can have fun with me and then sometimes you'll get like an older sad crowd a sad crowd like i, I was in uh oklahoma city yeah. at a club that's closed called the looney bin that's why i feel comfortable talking about it on film uh they can't book me anymore but uh uh that when they're sensitive that, that but it's hard you know sometimes you judge people 
And and I I was in I was in Orlando. It's called Oviendo. That's how bad it is. I, I land in a certain city. I have to go to a whole other city. That's the only place I can perform. And everyone in the audience, they looked like they saw Donald Trump as kind of a a fashion icon. Wow. So like like all the guys were a kind of orange glow and a kind of like they did they just come from golf? Probably not, but they look like they had. And and I was nervous. I said, you know, I'm going to do my jokes. And I'm listen, my jokes are very self self uh, uh, deprecating, but I also take some jabs. And much to my surprise, they ended up being a great audience. But I was worried in a moment that they'd go like, "Hey, don't say that." But but sometimes you'll be surprised. Um, and uh, uh, and then when they don't walk out of the room, I go, mm, maybe my jokes weren't biting enough. Okay. That's one thing I wanted to ask you about as a comedian. You know, especially now cancel culture and all that stuff. How do you guys know? I mean, you see certain shows from like Eddie Murphy from like was the eighties or nineties. I'm not sure. But I saw, and it, it can sometimes be borderline so offensive. So where sure. do you guys draw the line? Uh, you know, I think cancel culture is, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know exactly what it means. People have been getting in trouble for, th- George Carlin had to go to the Supreme Court because he cursed on the radio. You know, that was that cancel culture. Uh, times change. Um, I think if something's funny enough, you can usually get away with murder. Mm. But uh, I... I ultimately think most people who have been quote unquote canceled for a joke they said, most of them rebounded fine. Of course, with the internet, some people can get in outsized trouble. But if you're funny, people laugh at, at things that they don't even intend to. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure I've gotten in trouble for a tweet here or there, small. And I'm sure one day I'll get in trouble for some other joke. But I think if 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 your intentions are right and you're just trying to be funny and not trying to be offensive for the sake of being mm-hmm. offensive – you can usually survive in in this business. Who are your biggest comedic inspirations? Uh, I'm a big Anthony Jeselnik fan. Um, I I kind of I grew up on Chappelle and Dane Cook. I mean, that's just where I started. Like many, I'm I'm 34. Many people my age, Chappelle show and Dane Cook's like big big rise to fame was huge in high school. These days, I'm uh, I'm I'm big uh, Jessenick fan. Love John Mulaney, uh, uh, Maria Bamford, and I'm luckily I'm I'm at a point uh, working at the Comedy Cellar where I get to work with a lot of people. That if if I were to say who's the best right now, it's uh, it is people like Shane Gillis. It is I work with a comic named Jeffrey Asmus, uh, Caitlin Palufo, Jay Jordan. A lot of people that might not be household names quite yet, but I feel like I'm working with them while they're at their prime. And then when they become famous, then everyone knows them and they, they get worse. Wow. You know, that's what happens. You start making movies, you stop making good stand-up comedy. Wow. What, the James Corden? Yes, show. that's what, how he goes. You have to call him the James Corden. Yes. Can you tell us about that experience? Um, it, might, it was my first late night. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's a little weird because it's like, I think the show started taping at 6 p.m. So it feels early. The studio audience is like, it's a bigger room. Uh, there's less people than I thought. No one's drinking. So in, in certain ways, you're like, ooh, is this going to be a good enough crowd? Uh, but uh, they were great. James was very nice to me before I went on. And the audience was very supportive, other than my mom, who was there. And uh, when I saw her after, she said, I've heard all those jokes before. And I was like, yeah, mom, I wasn't going to do new material on James Corden, mom. Who's not even watching this? Uh, so it's great. I mean, it was it's, it's nerve wracking. It's it's like it's surreal to like it not be a stand up show. It's just a talk show, and then you just go up and uh, you only have one take. And if you fuck up, it's just too bad. Luckily, though, even if you do fuck up, no one watches late night anymore. So it changed my way in zero ways. Wow. It got me this interview. That was it. Yes. So. My parents are divorced. They've both been divorced uh, multiple times. Um, I remember once in school, they told us to draw a family tree, so I just turned in a pile of firewood. It's, uh, it was challenging having a lot of... You know, let me just say, there's one thing that, that uh, as someone who's had... Do you have divorced parents? Mm-hmm. Yeah. As, as someone who's been through a lot of divorce, pornography really exa- exaggerates like how often you have sex with your stepmoms. 
Oh my god. Uh, I just want to get the word out there because I've, I've, I've had four, four stepmoms. Oh my Not one god. hand job. So I just want to get the word out there. I think, uh, I, I feel like the guy holding this camera right now probably might have some false expectations oh about my. stepmoms. And, and it's good for you to know. What is your go-to joke? Uh, just that one I told about uh, the stepmoms and pornography. Uh, no, I have, uh, I, I have, I have, um, it always changes. That's the hardest part, especially before you're, you're famous, um, which I hope to be after this is released. Uh, <laughs> you have to, the audience sees you and they go, are you funny? And so that first joke is very hard. Comedians will hold on to their first joke for a very long time. Because once you figure out the way to like get the audience to go like, okay, we like you now, uh, that's a huge moment. So I, I've, I've had go-to jokes in the past that I try to get rid of so I'm not overly reliant on it. You know, uh, uh, during, during COVID, when the COVID was at the height, uh, back when we were doing outdoor shows, I was like, oh, fuck COVID. I'm so sick of washing my hands every time I shit. And that's just like right in there. <laughs> Uh, uh, and then other ones, you know, I opened my cordon with a, a joke about, you know, a subway encounter I had. And it's just like, it, it, it lets them know right out the gate what kind of person I am. Um, but that's always the hardest. It's, it's the opening and the closing and in between, no one cares. Wow. I always wondered about comedians because what if you're just not having, what if you're on tour, mm -hmm. you know, you've been doing headlining tours, which is crazy cool. Like, what if you're on tour and you're just not having a good day and now you have to light up the whole room? Like, sure. what do you rely on in those hard moments? Well, you know, uh, it happens a lot. I, I, think, I think people do stand up ultimately because when we get that attention from people in the audience, something in us becomes very happy, even if briefly. So I'm often in a bad mood and especially on tour. Because flying is, is a nightmare in this country. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are some days I land and the flight, flight was delayed. And, uh, you know, the, the hotel isn't there or it doesn't have Wi-Fi. So I, I'm in a bad mood plenty when I go up. And sometimes there's moments I'm like, I cannot go up there. I cannot believe I'm going to do an hour 15 right now. Mm -hmm. And once I get on that stage, there's nothing I can do. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, the second I get that first laugh... I'm like an addict again. I'm like, oh, I'm happy. And then I, you know, we'll end the night happy. Unless it's a bad set, then it's, uh, I'm in a bad mood for the next 24 hours. So, yeah. 24 hours. Oh, you know, you know, until I have a good set. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have, I have, you know, I have multiple spots tonight. And sometimes I'll have good set, great set, amazing set, bad set. That's all that matters. Nothing mattered that came before that. It's just the bad set. I always wondered, too, like, with comedy, shows i mean you guys have i mean memorization is a thing too it's something that i'm kind of i find hard to memorize things mm -hmm. but how do you kind of construct a show and you know with comedians is it all your material do you actually write all of your own stories i i first i find that i don't have a great memory either uh uh from memorizing like long scripts and stuff but when i write it that helps it stick. And then when something pops, there's just something, I think, emotion. You know how, like, you remember tragic things? I think it's the same with, like, exciting things. So I'm, I'm surprised sometimes how, how well I remember things that, comedy that I wrote. Um, and then it is uh, everything, you know, stuff that I, jokes that I wrote. Uh, uh, I'll do crowd work sometimes. I'll talk to the audience here and there. But I always am working on some new bit, some new line. And sometimes I'll plan it. Sometimes I'll bring up a notepad with me with just little one word things to remind me, oh, I want to talk about the parent trap tonight mm -hmm. or, I, or I want to talk about a uh, stepmom porn. And uh, so sometimes I'll have that there. But I like to le bounce around. I, I always leave the stage and I always go, oh, sh fuck, I forgot to talk about that. But uh, that's part of it. And you, you just try to remember as much as you can. Are you constantly like because you're telling – I'm assuming like these are real stories that you're telling, right? You know, slight exaggeration. Slight exaggeration. But are you constantly looking like throughout your life for inspiration or new material like within kind of your own scenarios? Sure. I mean, every 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 day stuff happens and and sometimes 
Sometimes I think like the more fucked up it is, sometimes it takes longer to figure out the funny version of it. Sometimes though it happens and you're like, is this bad? Like my dad had a, a heart surgery um, and uh, uh, you know, it, it, it didn't go the way we wanted. He's still alive. And uh, uh, that was a joke, by the way, just so you know, he's, uh, oh my God. he, he, you know, during the operation or leading up to it, there, there were weird family moments. There was, he's reading his will and announcing he was leaving a third of his will to his new girlfriend. And my sister got upset and all sorts of things. And, and sometimes in my head, I, I can't help it at this point. I'm like, Ooh, that's going to be, that's a really funny premise. Uh, and sometimes you wonder, I wonder, am, am I detached from feeling things? Cause I'm just looking for the joke. Oh, wow. And, and we'll see. That's deep. Yeah. Yeah. That's deep. But, uh, yeah, it happens all the time. Sometimes you have to find space where you're like, how can I not make a joke here? You know, uh, 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 uh I, I do couples counseling sometimes. How's and, that going? Wow. You do have a girlfriend. I've seen a few pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. That's how I like to bring up my girlfriend. We're in yes. couples counseling. But like that's like a space where it was like, you know, figuring out. I, I talk about my family kind of I'll say whatever I want. And I'm lucky. They don't give me pushback. Some people's families do not like it. Uh, but it's like couples counseling was like a new type of space where it wasn't just me. I can talk about my therapy as much as I want. But now I was having a very personal thing with my partner. And there's a degree where it's like, oh, well, I don't necessarily have permission to just share all of this comedically on stage. And this is a space where I'm hopefully not thinking of the joke as we're exploring each other's trauma. And so like it's, it's sometimes <laughs> figuring, it's yeah. figuring out spaces where I'm like, okay, I'm not going to be – you have to as a comedian sometimes I think – Turn it off. And it's tough. When you're with other comedians, okay. I were brutal. I don't care if we saw someone die. What right is it in like if there's a few comedians in a room? Is my question. What do you guys are? What do you like? We're, we're, we say stuff that would get us all in obscene trouble. A comedian's group chat, the things we oh, say shit. are beyond the pale. You guys have those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, there's not like one grand, like the, you know, no. of like, oh, let's see what Mulaney has to say about this. Uh, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I imagine everyone's group chats are a little bit spicy, but I think comedians like, it doesn't matter if a tragedy happened right now. You're, you're making some jokes and that's not necessarily healthy. Wow. You have a podcast too. So we are in his podcast studio. And there, I see multiple cameras. Yes. Um, can you tell us about your podcast? Uh, my podcast is called The Downside. It is a place where I bring on guests. Uh, you know, some of them are uh, famous in certain respect, but others it's just like they worked at a morgue or, uh, uh, you know, they, they used to be addicted to painkillers or they're a magician or they're a party clown. And I try to, like, give them a space to really uh, – uh, Tell me all the shitty parts of their lives, their professions, their experiences in a, in a place where I'm not going to be like, okay, well, don't complain or count your blessings. I want a place where they can really unload and they can tell me why their job sucks and they can tell me what's wrong with, with morgues and the way that they operate or, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the struggles of being a nurse or I had someone from RuPaul's Drag Race mm. and she really got into the the nitty gritty of how poorly they're paid. They're paid like $200 a day to be on that show. And to be a drag queen takes $200 to like, Get you ready. know, set up the bottom part. I mean, it's, it, there's so much. Uh, and, and I think people enjoy it. I think people, um, they, they complain to their loved ones and they have to put on a nice face for everyone else. And I want to create a place where they just, people, people listen and go, Oh, Thank God I'm not in RuPaul's Drag Race, or oh, thank God I'm not this person, and uh, hopefully feel related to, and then better about their own shitty lives. For all maybe the upcoming comedians, um, and just or kids that want to, you know, do what you do, Go can ahead. you tell us for real, like the real deal on how to do what you've done? Please quit. <gasps> no. Please. No. That I not what I, was I can't tell you. There are so many comedians right now. And you know what we need? We need a doctor. 
And if you can't be a doctor, we need a doctor's assistant. We need a nurse. We need a hospital administrator. <laughs> Truly, we got it covered. We, we got, got it covered. covered. We we got plenty for all the little, uh, you know, bachelorette party gigs and the bar mitzvah gigs and the comedy clubs. We don't we don't need you. No. So please, if you're a fan, come to a show. Come to a show. <laughs> Uh, I'll say I'll talk to you and you can have you can feel like oh I got a taste of it but it's not worth it Uh, uh, and uh, just do something else do something else okay I have a different question then (laughs) so how do you exercise your comedic powers I kind of exercise it by roasting up and coming comics trying to get them to quit it's kind of a really keep me in shape (laughs) uh you know, you just try to be funny. You just try to be funny. You, 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 I, I write every day. I, I perform almost every night. I'm, I'm listening back to the set. I'm, I'm tweeting, trying to just figure out how to be funnier, how to be tighter, and then watching the comics who I think are really tremendous and going, fuck, how do I, what, what can I learn from, from how well they're doing up there? And it's, uh, it's an everyday thing. And like, People, you got to find the ways that you're funny. Everyone's funny in different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, and you got to find the way that you are funny and hone that. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I always say you, you, you might not necessarily, you might not be a great comedian deep down. You might not be one of the best, but I can easily look back on the comedian was three years ago, two years ago, six months ago and go, I am better than that shitty motherfucker. And that's, that's progress at least. Wow. This is like a therapeutic, like inspirational talk with you today. What are some upcoming projects or tours? What, what can we, what sure. can we find you and watch a I show? Tour every weekend. Um, so find me online at your Marcus Arezi. I'm, uh, I'm going all sorts of places. I'm going to Austin this weekend, but then I go to Baltimore and then I go to LA and then I go to, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, for some reason, and I got Houston, <laughs> Seattle. Uh, I, I'm 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 going to Aruba, so it's it's I'm traveling all over all the time. If you want to see, if you're in New York City, I I run a show. It's called The Silver Lining. It's nearby here on the Lower East Side, and that's where you see me work out new material. That's like if you if you like like comedy and you like my work, that's a place to really see kind of how I hone my craft. But otherwise, just find me online. I tour, and uh, YouTube my name. You can see my Comedy Central set, my uh, my Just for Laugh set. So just it's my name. Yay, Gianmarco! <laughs>